On the virtual Bible study tonight, we're going to talk with a former Muslim who's converted to Christianity. He's going to help us to understand more about Islam and more about why he believes that Jesus Christ is the one we should be following today. It's going to be an excellent discussion. You'll want to be a part of it, and we're going to get started right now. It's time for this week's edition of the Virtual Bible Study. The Virtual Bible Study is a live, internet-only call-in program dedicated to the honest study and discussion of God's Word. Do you have a question about something in the Bible? Or are you simply interested in learning more about the Scriptures? If so, we hope you'll stay tuned tonight as we look into the pages of God's Word. The Virtual Bible Study is brought to you this time each week by the College View Church of Christ in Columbia, Tennessee. You can participate in the discussion tonight by calling 93 one three eight one four five six seven or by emailing your questions or comments from collegeview.com we hope you'll take out your bibles and study along with us as we begin an exciting study of god's word on this edition of the virtual bible study and we welcome you to the virtual bible study this is the virtual bible study for thursday February 21st, 2019. Thank you for joining us on the program tonight. My name is Jacob Gwynn. My father, Greg Gwynn, is here. Hello, Dad. Jacob, great to be with you tonight on good, the Virtual Bible good Study. Good to be with you as well. And Kyle's behind the controls. Kyle, welcome to the program. Welcome back after a week of absence. Yeah, it's good to be here. Glad, to, glad to have you. We look forward to hearing from you tonight on the phone at 877-381-4567. Questions at collegeview.com. And if you're watching us live in the chat room where you can chat with other listeners tonight, we see Sarah, Jeff, Willa Dean, Stephen, Kevin, Mount Pleasant, Tennessee, Dwight and out in Iowa, and Rich on in the chat room tonight. And you can sign in and chat with other listeners there as well. We'll look forward to your comments uh, on the program tonight. Well, this should be a really interesting study, Jacob. Am I getting out? I'm not hearing myself. You are. Okay. Yep. Uh, an interesting study. We're, we're interviewing uh, a brother who was converted from Islam. We actually talked with him, and I checked our archives today, Jacob. Yep. Uh, uh, we talked with him about four and a half years ago, uh, and, uh, and we had an interesting discussion with him, and this should be an interesting follow-up to that. It, it should be, and uh, we'll welcome him. He's on the phone tonight, and uh, for security purposes, uh, we're going to call him Mike. Mike, welcome to the Virtual Bible Study. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. Um, we'll look uh, forward to uh, talking with you. Uh, but, Mike, we have, to, we have to use an alias, unfortunately, because there maybe is some concern about your safety as a result of your abandoning uh, the, the Muslim faith. Uh, that's right. Um, if you're a Muslim and you look Islam to any other religion, uh, it's just not going to be the safest thing for you, and um, uh, you most likely will get uh, killed. And uh, that actually started with the first days of Islam when uh, Muhammad died. Um, a lot of people who believed in Islam believed in him. And when he died, a lot of people left Islam and went back to their uh, old religion. And um, in order to prevent and scare others from doing the same thing, uh, the early Muslims start killing everybody who uh, left Islam. And the tradition still carried. If you're a Muslim today um, and you left Islam and converted to any religion, uh, it's just not the safest for you. Um, so, Mike, yeah. I, one of the, what I really like to hear you emphasize some, uh, in many different ways in, in our discussion tonight is uh, obviously the contrast between Christianity and Islam. And one of the things I wanted to, to have you discuss is what you've already brought up, uh, the idea that there's a, there's a violence associated with the religion of Islam. Uh, now, in all fairness, there have been abuses conducted in the name of Christianity throughout the centuries. We understand that. We don't, we don't hold to that at all. We don't think that Jesus or his uh, disciples taught or practiced violence in the, in the furtherance of their doctrine and their teaching. But clearly there is at least a strong element among those who practice Islam toward violence in regards to enforcing their view. Uh, could, could you comment a little bit more about that? I mean, well, it first of all, it started with uh, how uh, Islam was spread in the Middle East. Uh, originally, it all the spreading in the Middle East of Islam started with wars. So that was the first thing. And also, the interesting thing about Islam, or what makes it different than any other religions, is uh, that if you're a Muslim, uh, 
the Quran said, which is the holy book for Muslims, said that you read the verse, right, and you make your own, your own understanding, and God will uh, judge you based on your understanding. So some people can read a verse that, you know, does not seem violent um, or seems violent, and they can take it to any explanation they want, and they will be correct, and God will uh, prove whatever explanation so people make. So, and also, the way I, when I was studying Islam and Christianity and other religions, um, I didn't really judge any religion based on what people did because people are different. You know, there is good people and bad people everywhere. In yeah, every I think religion. that's a good point. Exactly. Sure. In any country, um, in any nation, really, you're going to find good people and bad people. Uh, but I personally, that's how I do it. I judge a religion based on what the book itself says and based on what the prophet or the person who brought the religion did or said. And there's a huge, huge gap when you use see what the person who brought Islam did and the person who brought Christianity did. On one hand, the person who brought Islam, you know, he, uh, he was a leader of many wars. He joined, he was in many uh, fights. He killed people. On the other hand, the person who brought Christianity, um, he said, uh, pray for those who, uh, pray, pray for your enemy. And he himself prayed for those who were killing him on the cross. Okay, so, so that was... Uh, j just to emphasize what you're saying there, I think it's a really excellent observation. There are there are proponents of Christianity have been historically who have done bad things, and there are proponents of Islam and have been for centuries that have done bad things. But your approach is go back to the to the persons who began these religions, and 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 the contrast is between Jesus and Muhammad. Muhammad was a violent man, as you said. He he led many wars and killed many people, whereas Jesus was a peaceful man who, who never did anything like that. Uh, that's that's absolutely right. I mean, Jesus Jesus' whole message was to come to earth so he can die on the cross to take all our sins away. That was his ultimate goal. That's the only reason he came to earth. So he ultimately came here to die and suffer for us. On the other hand, another person who came with another religion, and he started so many wars. So here's the contrast. Uh, I see your point exactly. All right, uh, let's go to Louisville, Kentucky, and welcome Steve to the Virtual Bible Study. Steve, welcome to the program. Are you there? We may have a connection problem there. We'll, we'll, we'll work on that. Uh, Mike, uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, about Islam and, uh, and where it started. So Islam started in uh, the city of Mecca in Saudi Arabia. That's where Muhammad was born. And um, ironically, even though it's, you know, it's the biggest hub for Islam or the holy city for Muslims and Islam, and supposedly Islam is trying to spread its religion to everybody, um, non-Muslims cannot go to visit Mecca, um, as ironic as that might sound. So Muslims want to spread Islam, yet they're not welcoming or inviting every, anybody at all uh, to visit the city of Mecca. And I'm not really sure how they do this. I don't know how they would know if you're a Muslim or not. Uh, I guess from your name, if your name is um, Muhammad, you're probably a Muslim. If your name is uh, John, you're probably not. <laughs> but I'm not sure how they can uh, tell. Uh, but if you're not Muslim, you're not welcome to Mecca. You cannot visit the city at all. I see. And, I uh, see on some. Uh, I see on some uh, presentation slides that you sent us that even on the on the road signs leading into Mecca, uh, certain lanes are designated for Muslims only, and others are not allowed. Uh, that's correct. And just so I can be clear, I don't. I didn't take this picture myself, but when I was googling, I found that picture. So. Yeah. So, but but I know if you're not Muslim, you're not. You cannot visit Mecca at all. So the the, the religion supposedly started in Mecca, uh, yep. and and they they have contrived some. Uh, the Muslims have contrived some history uh, relative to Abraham and Mecca, as I understand it. Uh, well, um, if you read the Bible and you read the Quran, um, all the. The both, both of the books pretty much uh, historically agree on all the things from Adam and Eve till Abraham. They agree on almost all the stories. Um, there's some little differences here and there, but the, but the whole story is pretty much the same. The Muslims believe that God told Abraham and his son Israel to go to this uh, city and build the uh, Kaaba, which is that cubicle building in Mecca that every, all the Muslims go and worship. And uh, according to the Muslim faith, uh, faith uh, uh, Abraham and uh, Ishmael, they went there on the 5th century B.C., and that's where, and that's when they built it. 
Um, and uh, when Islam started, uh, Mecca was really, if, if anybody ever been to Mecca, it's very hot. The climate is terrible. Um, there's no really any, any natural resources there at all. Uh, but a lot of people moved there after Abraham and Ishmael uh, built uh, the Kaaba because it's a very religious, very holy site. So a lot of people went there. A lot of uh, pagan religions went there. And they start making and selling their own god statues. And that's uh, how a lot of people went to live in Mecca in that time. And um, if you see the, uh, the Kaaba, the Mecca today, uh, it's a huge city. I think, the most, I think the biggest mosque there can take about maybe 3 million people with all the new things that uh, Saudi Arabia has been doing. Um, uh, so it's huge, huge mosque, huge city, um, and it's very religious right now. Um, I know that the, um, in Saudi Arabia, they don't sell alcohol anywhere in the, in the country at all, but they sell cigarettes and, and cigars, uh, except in Mecca and Medina. Uh, the only two cities that, from my, I've been there a couple of times, but from my rep- remembrance, you don't really sell cigarettes in in uh, Mecca at all. Okay, now yeah, give us a little bit. Give us a little bit of a time stamp here uh, on when the events that that propagated the beginning of of, it, of the religion of Islam. Uh, Muhammad lived uh, around 600 A.D. Am I correct? Uh, he was born in 570 A.D. Uh, in the city of Mecca. Five seventy, uh, right? Uh-huh. Yes. And the Muslims uh, say, call the city the city uh, the, um, this year the year of elephant uh, because they believe that there's a guy, a uh, very powerful guy back in the days. Um, he wanted people to come and worship him because he was very powerful, very rich man. And people didn't worship him and they went to worship Kaaba. So he got a big, huge army of elephants to go and destroy the entire city. Uh, but Muslims believe God was powerful enough and he defeated the entire uh, elephant army. And in that year, the year of the elephant, uh, Muhammad was born. 570, okay. So we're, we're talking a, 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 approximately six centuries after Christ was when Muhammad Correct. lived, just so that we all have sort of a, a handle on the time frame. Correct. And they want to trace their lineage back, though, all the way back to Ishmael. Is that correct? Abraham. They believe Abraham was the first Muslim. Okay. And then the but the and then the, and the descendants were of Muhammad were through Ishmael, correct. Okay. All right. So now, now you, you give a little bit of history. I, I know about Muhammad himself that he he was not a uh, a religious man in his early days. He was actually a merchant man uh, initially. Is that correct? Correct. Well, um, his father died before he was born, so he never met his father. And his mother died when he was very young age. And then after that, he went to live with his uncle, who uh, was a, a merchant. He, uh, he used to do trades from Yemen in the south to Syria twice a year. They called him the trip for the winter and trip for the summer. I think for the winter, they go to Yemen. For the summer, uh, they go to Syria. And he did that until he was 40 years old, until he uh, married uh, his wife. Uh, Khadija, uh, who was also a very rich, wealthy uh, merchant, and he married her, and he kept doing the same thing with her. He kept taking all the trades every year from Yemen to Mecca, from Mecca to Syria, and he did that twice a year, the two trips. So that's that's how he, um, that's before he became a prophet or became, he uh, started seeing a vision. But he, uh, now, he uh, after he had married and after he'd been engaged in this merchant trade for some good while, he began to have visions. Is that correct? Or claimed at yeah. least he had visions? Yeah, when he was 40 years old, um, he used to go and uh, meditate in one of the caves in around the city he lived in. And one day when he was 40 years old, uh, he started seeing a vision and he saw, um, he said that he saw an angel, uh, Gabriel. Uh, he saw him, and the angel told him to read, and uh, Muhammad was illiterate, so he didn't know how to read or write, and he was scared. He went back home to his wife, and he told her what he saw, and she supported him. She was the first supporter, the first believer in him, and that's how he uh, started seeing visions, and that's how he um, supposedly became a prophet, started his, started his prophecy. Okay, so uh, uh, therefore the the... The religion of Islam, based upon the, the teachings of, of Muhammad, date to that time frame, and based upon what he claimed to be visions that he received, uh, delivered initially at least through the, the angel Gabriel, um, 
But uh, he didn't. He didn't live very long after he began the, these endeavors. He died relatively shortly after. He died in what six twenty two, I think you say. Uh, he died. He died when he was sixty years old. Um, I think he died um, six thirty two. Uh, six thirty two. Okay. All right. Yeah, but on six twenty two, um, him and all the Muslims in Mecca they went to Medina, which is a city north of Mecca because they were being persecuted in Mecca. Uh, and he was being persecuted by the city, by the people he grew up with. So they were, they did not believe in him, and they were persecuting him, and that he went to Medina in 622. And he moved there, uh, hoping for, you know, a freedom. Uh, he, he was hoping to be somewhere where he can have a freedom of religion, so he can spread his message to everybody uh, safely. And, 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 he and, was, he, and he was accepted there, uh, at least in a better way than he was at Mecca. Uh, but eventually he returned to Mecca, and there was, there was some real warfare go that went on. Is that correct? Mike, are you there? Did we lose Mike? We might have. It may be a good time for a break. Can, can you, you hear me? There now we hear you. Now we hear you. Yeah, uh, he, uh, he had a freedom of religion in, in Mecca, in Medina, I mean. And he started spreading Islam, and Islam gets really powerful. And he had so many people, so many followers after him. And when he, when he got powerful enough, he decided to go back to Mecca. And that was the first war. Um, and he went back to Mecca to get the city back. And uh, he won the war because he had more people than the city of Mecca. And he won the war, and he went back to back. And, and so again, and we need to take a break here, but just just to sort of summarize, this is just sort of a thumbnail sketch of the life of Muhammad. But it it his religion began with acts of violence, uh, and uh, he propagated his religious cause through acts of violence, and that's one of the great contrasts that we see between Muhammad and Jesus Christ, and we want to talk a little bit more about that, Mike, but we're going to take a break real quick, uh, uh, and then we'll get back to this on the other side. We've got some comments in the chat room, and uh, we want your comments as well. Sign in and send them there, or give us a call at 877-381-4567. We're back talking with Mike right after this. Enjoying the virtual Bible study? Email a friend during this break and tell them to join in on the discussion. There's more exciting Bible study after this commercial. What does your church have for my children? At the College View Church of Christ, we don't have pizza parties or putt-putt nights. We don't have softball or basketball. We do have the Bible. We do have the powerful sayings of the gospel of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We do have the love for your children's souls to never substitute the solid spiritual teaching they need with superficial secular activities. If this is what you want for your children, bring them to Bible class this Sunday at 9.30 a.m. at the College View Church of Christ. Here's some quotes worth pondering. The devil is an artist. He paints sin in very attractive colors. Trust God's authority, not man's majority. The greatest use of life is to spend it for something that outlasts it. Most of the people who died today expected to live a lot longer. Man, wish I'd said that. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6. The virtual Bible study continues. We're back on the program tonight talking with Mike, who was a former Muslim. He's converted uh, to Christianity, and uh, he's explaining to us uh, some more about uh, Islam and and the, the practices and beliefs of those who are Muslim. I have a question, Mike. Uh, you know... Uh, that Muhammad lived uh, some 600 years, 700 years after Christ, but yeah. uh, 600 years. But and then he's. They say that Abraham was the first Muslim. Was were there practicing Muslims before Muhammad? Well, no. The Muslims believe that Abraham is the first Muslim because God told him to go to say Mecca and to build Al Kaaba, and that's how uh, they say that Abraham was the first Muslim. Okay. 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 So that, but that's, of course, that's not in the Bible, but that's in the teachings of Islam. Uh, but, got, but, but then there's no history of anyone being a practicing Muslim after that until Muhammad. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. Okay. All right. Now, uh, let's a, a little bit of a, a, a let's deal just a little bit in contrast of some more about Muhammad and Jesus. Uh, there were prophecies about Jesus. In fact, in our chat room window, Stephen says, uh, how do the Muslims account for the 300 or so prophecies that Jesus fulfilled? 
Um, do they, uh, Muslims accept the Bible? They claim that the Bible is from God, do they not? Uh, At least so the, Muslims Old believe, the Old Testament scriptures. Uh, Muslims don't really believe in the Bible uh, because they say it's been corrupted throughout the years. It's not the same Bible that God gave to Jesus. So they believe that Jesus, uh, they believe in Jesus, but they don't believe he's the Son of God. They just believe he's a prophet. Uh, but they say the Bible that he had back in the days is not the same one day uh, people have today. So they believe that they, they, they would make a claim that the Bible has been corrupted over time. And Correct. So, and so that you can't really trust the current Bible to be true to the, to the, to the original. Yes. Now, how about the Koran? How does it, how, how does it line up? Uh, are there errors and inconsistencies, as you might expect, in, in that document? Well, um, see, the thing about the Koran and Islam, it's only in Arabic. Uh, I know it's been translated now to many languages, but if you want to be a Muslim and if you want to read it, you have to read it in Arabic. So Muslims will tell you that the Quran is in Arabic, it's never been translated, it's still the same version, uh, there's no alternation in any translation, so it has not been corrupted. That's the argument they will use to tell you that the, uh, the Quran is, has not been corrupted. But, but of course it has been translated. I mean, uh, all of us... It has, it has been translated, but... It has been translated, and I myself can speak uh, three, four languages. And when you read the Bible in different languages, you can't really translate it. Like, literally, it does not make a whole lot of sense when you read it in a different language. So, okay. they always say if you're going to be a Muslim, you have to read it in Arabic. Okay. Um, so, uh, kind of following along with the presentation that you, that you forwarded to us, uh, Mohammed was now he, he again was illiterate so he didn't read or write different parts of the Quran right well uh, yes and that's um, when you ask Muslims what miracles does Muhammad do and they will tell you you know he never know how to read or write he was illiterate and yet he came up with uh, a book that was literature uh, that was very complex literature wise uh, so yes he came up with the book but he didn't know how to read or write Okay, and that, that's sort of an interesting contradiction in itself, isn't it? Um, of course, we believe, according to the Scriptures, that Jesus lived a sinless life, was born without sin, and lived a sinless life, uh, whereas even the Quran acknowledges that Muhammad was not a sinless man. Is that correct? Uh, correct. Well, in John eight forty six, it tells you, you know, uh, that Jesus was a sinless uh, person, he never sinned in his life, but in the Quran it, it tells you, it's very clear that Muhammad is just a human being, just a person, and he's a sinner, and so is everybody else, so that's one of the big differences, you know, the uh, Bible tells you that Jesus is a sinless person, um, and Muhammad is a um, sinful person, so who would you like to listen to more, who would you like to follow, you know, a sinless person or a sinful person? Okay, uh, well, one of the references that you forwarded to us was Surah 48, 1 and 2. We gave you a glorious victory so that God may forgive you your past and future sins. And so Correct. even in the Quran, uh, a statement concerning the fact that Muhammad, Muhammad didn't claim sinlessness, uh, and, and uh, the Muslims do not believe that he was a sinless one. Um, uh, like just continuing on with what you've, uh, have forwarded to us. Uh, there were some real differences in the way that Jesus and Muhammad conducted themselves relative to sinful people. Can you expound on that a little bit? Uh, absolutely. So one of the big differences, um, and it's kind of the same story, but completely different reactions from, from both of them. Um, in John 8, 2 and, until 11, you know, it tells you the story of the Pharisees and how they went to Jesus and told him, you know, about the... Um, women who commit adultery and how she's a simple person and she needs to be killed. And the way Jesus handled that really uh, completely blows my mind away uh, because he told them, you know, they're trying to trick him, they're trying to get him to uh, sin. He, he knew but it was the way a trap. He, yeah, he knew it was a trap, didn't he? Uh, yes. And the way he handled it was, was uh, amazing. He basically told them, whoever doesn't have a sin, uh, whoever without a sin, cast the first stone. Right. So it tells you that Jesus, you know, forgave the sinners. But on the other hand, there's a story um, in Islam that tells you about Muhammad and how a group of people went to him and told him, this woman 
uh, there's some woman that committed adultery and she's pregnant now. She uh, she's carrying a baby, and he went to visit to visit the woman and he told her, you know, don't worry about it, it's okay until she gave birth, and then uh, they stoned her to death. So that it's the same story, it's the same sin. But the way Jesus handled it is completely different than the way Muhammad handled it. So there's just there's an example of of, of a of contrast between the two, in regards to how they interacted with sinful people. Uh, and so we have the case of Jesus with a woman taken in adultery in John 8, which was obviously a set-up trap uh, on the part of his uh, enemies. Uh, he didn't fall into the trap. Uh, in fact, he wisely handled that situation. He didn't condone sin, but on the other hand, he didn't let them trap him into, into a situation. Whereas on the other hand, Muhammad actually did have a woman taken in adultery stoned to death. All right, let's uh, let's go to the phones and welcome a listener. Uh, hello, uh, who are we speaking with tonight? Well, if you're speaking to me, my name would be Aline. Aline, yes, we're speaking to you. Where are you calling from tonight? I'm calling from Nashville, Tennessee. Appreciate you calling. Uh, what are your questions or comments tonight? Well, I don't have any uh, questions, and I'd just like to respond what what you just talked about. First of all, Muhammad never stoned anybody for being unchaste and having children out of wedlock. And you are correct, Jesus did stone, did say those without sin cast the first stone, and that was because the people that accused the woman of being improper were the people that were making her improper. Um, I'd just like to just to touch base with you, let me tell you, first of all, I'm a practicing convert Muslim. So I'm here to just speak with y'all with no hate, yeah. no bigotry, none of that mess. Because, first of all, one of the first questions I saw was how do we, how do we, involve, how do we approach those that are involved in it? You know how you approach us? The same way we approach you. We love you, believe it or not. We follow Jesus we follow Muhammad. Muhammad is a sinless, is not a sinless person. Muhammad was a sinner. Jesus was not. Muhammad knew that. Muhammad knew that Jesus was not a sinner. And Muhammad tried to follow the path of Jesus. Let, let me ask you. Therefore, uh-huh. let me ask you a question. Yeah. Uh, thanks for calling. Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you. Uh, what was what was the 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 the, the, the sort of the, the uh, and we only have a brief amount of time obviously but uh, what was uh-huh. it that convinced you to change from Christianity to Islam what what was the what well, was you guys that? are going to freak out you know what I was studying to become a Jesuit priest hello <laughs> I was studying to become a Jesuit priest and the more I read the more I saw how to pray the more I saw how to clean myself the more I saw that Jesus what he really said time after time what? was that the Lord God is your master the Lord God is your master there is none greater than he simple statement end of story <laughs> and how does that but how does that differ with Christianity <laughs> Uh, can you well, hear me? No, this hang, is the thing. This minute, is the thing. Mike, I don't think he can hear you. Hang okay, on. We'll work on that. Go ahead. No, I heard him. I heard him. He oh, said, what, what does it differ in and what, what makes it different than Christianity? Yes. The only difference between us and y'all is we don't believe that we have to go through someone to get to God. That's it. We don't believe that we have to say, in the name of Jesus. We don't pray through Jesus to get to God. We solely take our problems, our worship, everything that's wrong in our lives, we simply put it down on our prayer mats and give it to God alone. There's no one worthy of worship other than God. So therefore, I ask for no one to help me. I don't ask Muhammad. I don't ask Jesus. I ask God for help, and solely God. And, um... And, and, and as far as the rest of it is, uh, when I pray, I don't pray for the death of Christians. I don't pray for death and destruction. I don't pray for hate and hateful things. I pray for love, peace, mercy, compassion for all. I pray for what I want for myself, I want for you. Uh, well, I think those are all obviously noble, uh, noble things that you have described. However, you would acknowledge that not all of those who are proponents of Islam are of the same so, mindset as you. You you're okay, you're right because I've done the studies because yeah. I know you're absolutely right. I'm yeah. not going to sit here and say, I'm not going to sit here and try and hide the fact that there are evil people in every single religion. 
Well, that's true. And, that's and, true. And, and as I said earlier, I don't know if you caught it earlier, I said there's certainly been, and, and, and our guest Mike said the same thing, that we don't try to defend everybody who ever called themselves a Christian, and you shouldn't have to right. try to defend everybody who called, ever called themselves right. a Muslim. We understand it. That, and, and, and obviously that's just a, a matter of fairness. All right. Uh, but, uh, what, I, what I'll just end up with, because I know our time is short, I'll just tell you this. The majority of us, the the major majority of us, yeah, unfortunately, the silent majority of us, the ones that aren't saying anything, we are completely, vehemently against terrorism and all that crud that everybody's talking about. We're really, really... Let me ask you a quick question, and then we've got to go. Why, right, are you, why are you silent about that? Why, why don't you speak out about that? I mean, if I actually am not silent because the silent majority has never changed anything. If we stay silent against extremism, I'm against extremism. I would tell you honestly, if I was in the mosque, if I was praying and a brother said something extremist to me, there would be it would be a problem. Okay, it would be a big problem. Let, let's. <laughs> I, I've got one. I've got a, a question quickly. Uh, Mike, I don't know. Mike, can you hear the caller? Uh, no. Okay, okay. I, was, I was afraid of that. Yeah. Um, we'll be right back uh, to you, what, Mike. Hang what, on. What what um, uh, what is that? What does salvation look like uh, to a Muslim as far as what 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 uh, for atonement for sin? Uh, how does how do you make remedy for your sins as in Islam? We we. we uh, we pray so five, days, do we pray five work, times like, a day. Uh, the Quran told you to do, and everybody sins, and then eventually God uh, kind of sort of measures both of them on a on a scale of some sort, and then God sees uh, if you did good or bad. But eventually, uh, you don't go to heaven or hell at all based on your work, but you go by the mercy of God. So, okay. so you can so. do bad and go to heaven, or you can go, do good and go to hell. It's it's all based on the uh, God kind of scale. Once you did good or bad, and then eventually God decides based on His mercy to you. So, all right, uh, that's that, not, that was my That's explaining. not true at all. Okay, okay, that's you, not true at you all. You want to answer? You want to rebut that? Yes, I do want to rebut that. That's not true at all. First of all, how we how we attain salvation is we ask for forgiveness and we seek forgiveness in every single prayer. We seek for forgiveness for our sins. We seek forgiveness for our actions. It is believed by us that there is no way into heaven or into hell but by God's decree. There's no magic scale. There's no if you do good, you're going to hell because God said so. I mean, that's a possibility because God is God after all. But there's there's not that there's not that black and white if there's not that that false i i think what i heard him say i'm trying to be clear but i'm kind of caught up because i'm emotional um it, it's not it's there isn't a there isn't a scale it's it's either you have done the worship the works and the deeds or you have not the the one thing that we believe that that god is going to ask us about the most is our prayer and our charity what well, uh, we keep asking you we say we're not going to ask you another, but let me make this one last question is it would you would you deny or acknowledge that the practice of islam is a religion uh, a works-based religion, and if you are saved, it will be based upon the works that you have done as judged by God. Not alone, no. What would be the other factor then? If it's not your personal works, what what it's, what makes up the gap between what you do and what you need, what you what you become, and what you need to be? In other words, we as Christians, we claim that it's God's grace. We do we we try, but we fail. We're not as uh, we not we are not capable of being perfect people and yep. so we trust the grace of God manifested yep. through his son Jesus Christ to be to make up that that we can't do ourselves how, how would a Muslim get that we 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 rely on the grace of God alone we re, we re, rely on God's all-encompassing mercy okay great listen we've got to let you go we, we're over time here and we appreciate you calling in appreciate your good spirit yep. and uh, we'll, we'll continue to discuss these things Yep, just let me say peace, mercy, and blessings of God be upon you all. Please understand that we love you, you love us, and we'll love you back. Okay. We do love you, and we appreciate you calling. Okay, God bless. Good night. All right, uh, we are up against a break, and uh, we need to get that break, and we'll get back we, to we got to get back to Mike and let him continue telling us a little bit more as he sees this great contrast between Christ and Muhammad. All right, and we, again, we do appreciate the, the caller from Nashville tonight and uh, a good discussion. We could have taken that discussion 
way past the end of the hour. But yeah. We've got Mike here, so we need to talk with him. We'll talk with you on the other side. Don't go anywhere. The Virtual Bible Study continues right after this. Did you hear what they just said? Call in during this break and let everyone know what you think. The Virtual Bible Study continues after this announcement. This is Greg Gwynn with this week's bullet point. How do you evaluate a congregation? We all do it. We decide that a particular church is good, another is so-so, and yet another is not what we like at all. While we understand that such judgments are natural and necessary, our concern is about the basis upon which we make these choices. We have heard Christians who make comments like, that church is not friendly. The preacher preaches too long. They keep the building too hot or too cold and so forth. On a positive side, they might say, they have activities for young folks. They have a lot of get-togethers. We like to hear that song leader. Would you like to know the true basis for determining a good church? Let Jesus show you. Read the letters to the seven churches of Asia recorded in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. Two of those seven churches, Smyrna and Philadelphia, receive high praise and no rebuke. Both of those churches were commended for their dedicated stand for the truth, even in the face of persecution. There's no hint of the superficial social activity that so many people are looking for these days. These were simply congregations that took a strong stand for the truth and demonstrated a diehard conviction for what was right. Would you have been happy as a member at Smyrna or Philadelphia? We can't guarantee that the folks there were overtly friendly or that there were lots of get-togethers or that the singing was top-notch. They were just dedicated Christians doing their spiritual work. Would this be enough for you? It was for Jesus. That's this week's bullet point. Think about it. I'm James Buchanan from Columbia, Tennessee, and I love to listen to the virtual Bible study. Broadcasting around the world with truths that are out of this world. The Virtual Bible Study. Take it away, guys. We're back on the Virtual Bible Study tonight, and we're talking with Mike, uh, who is a converted Muslim. He's now a Christian, and we're talking about the contrast between Islam and Christianity. We want to remind you this program is brought to you by the College of Church of Christ in Columbia, Tennessee. We want you to contact us at any time if you have questions, comments, agree or disagree with something you've heard on the program Send us an email to questions at collegeview.com. We'd love to have further discussion with you uh, off of the air or even on the air. And we appreciate, again, our caller who disagree with us tonight. And we welcome you, if you disagree with us, to give us a call at any time. All right. Well, we got a lot of comments in the chat room, we Jacob, do. that we're just not going to be able to get to tonight. But you guys keep talking in the chat room, talk among yourselves as you hear Mike explaining. Mike, we, we want you to continue uh, uh, with some of these contrasts that you see between Christ and Mohammed, between Christianity and Islam. Uh, one of the areas that you mentioned that is significant is in regards to the status of women in these religions. Uh, yes, so according to the Bible and according to all the historical uh, evidence, uh, Jesus was never married. He never really uh, had a sexual relationship. On the other hand, he healed women and he forgave women, as I said about the women who committed adultery. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, Muhammad was married 12 times. Um, not all at the same time, but in Islam, you can marry up to four women at the same time. And um, but and if you're a Muslim man, you can marry uh, a woman from any other religion. But if you're a Muslim woman, you have to marry a Muslim man. So. And so, and, and Muhammad, I think you said, was married 12 different times? Uh, yes, he married 12 women. Yes. Yeah, okay. So there, there, there's a, a pretty notable distinction, not only between the two individuals, Jesus and Muhammad, but also between what's taught in the religion of Jesus versus the religion of Muhammad. What about, we know, and we see this, we see news coverage about the, the uh, Muslims praying. They pray a lot. They pray at regular intervals throughout every day. Uh, to kind of contrast the, what we see taught about prayer in the New Testament with what the Muslims practice. Uh, well, if you're a Muslim, there's five pillars in Islam that every Muslim has to do. Otherwise, you are not going to be a Muslim. Uh, they're the fundamentals of Islam, and the first one is to declare God is only God, and um, Muhammad is the last prophet. And the second most important pillar um, is to pray. So if you don't, if you're a Muslim and you don't pray. And I know a lot of Muslims who don't really pray at all. Uh, I know they still consider themselves as Muslims, but if you don't pray according to Islam, according to the five pillars of Islam, you're not really Muslim. So if you're a Muslim, you have to pray, and you pray five times a day. And uh, uh, I think first prayer is like four in the morning, and it goes throughout the day, and you have to pray five times. Uh, but during the prayer, there's so many things that can happen during the prayer that can cancel your prayer. Um, first of all, you pray, and you can be as sincere as you can possibly can. 
but you don't really know if your prayer is accepted or not. It's all to God. Um, you can pray, you can be very sincere, uh, but you don't really know if it's been accepted or not. And also, if you're praying and somebody walks in front of you, uh, or you get distracted, uh, your prayer is canceled. Or if you pray in a mosque uh, and uh, you start praying before the imam, uh, which is the preacher who leads the prayer, um, kind of, um, your prayer is not really counted. Um, and if, um, if men are praying and we have to stand right next to each other, that shoulder has to be very tight and the next person's shoulder. Um, and in every prayer in Islam, before you pray, the uh, imam will tell you, you have to, cl- to close the gaps between you, otherwise the prayers are going to be accepted. So even though pray- prayer is very, very important, very fundamental thing to Muslims, there's so many little things that does not really make a whole lot of sense that can cancel your prayer. So, so just some interesting kind of quirks about the, the practice of prayer. Uh, but as you said, Jesus, the, the teaching of Jesus in regards to prayer is quite simple. Prayer, prayer from the heart. Yes. Uh, you know, in, in Christianity, Jesus told you to get in your knee or, or to sit or just to be sincerely in your heart and to pray to God and ask Him anything, and God will uh, answer you. Mm-hmm. But in, in Islam, it's very complicated, very complex. It's five times a day, and it's mandatory, and there's so many things that can cancel your prayer. And if your prayer is not accepted, you really cannot be a Muslim. And it's just, it's more complicated in Islam than it is in Christianity. On, 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 I think how we should be able to talk to God. I and mean, in Christianity, it's just very simple. It's just in your heart, you talk to God. But in Islam, it's just more complicated. Now, are the prayers uh, very formal? and uh, Or are, are they something that's repeated? Is it a, a set thing that you pray? Or is, are, is it more open than that? No, I'm sorry, what? Like, no, no, no words, are they, the Hail Mary. Are, 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 like they, are they pre, preset, prescribed prayers, or is it more just uh, what, whatever is on your mind? Mike, Mike are you there? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, no, there is actually a specific uh, rules and rituals that you have to follow in the prayer. Uh, you, can, you can make them up. You have to stand a certain way, and you have to say certain things. And you have to bend, uh, you have to lean down a certain way, and you have to get on your knee a certain way. It's it's very specific. It's uh, you have to do. It's a kind of sort of like a a, a daily ritual that you have to do. Uh, very formal, very organized, very. But but, but they uh, would not, not be necessarily. They would not be necessarily memorized or or pre-written you, prayers. Yeah, you, ha- you have to memorize. Yes. Okay, so you do. Okay. Yes. Uh, 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 I want to go a little bit quickly. I want to uh, uh, skip over a section because we kind of already talked about some of the wars that were involved even in the lifetime of Muhammad. There was a, there were a lot of physical warring that went on uh, with him and his followers. But I want to skip to a section of your presentation where you talked about miracles. You know, one of the things that we really believe, that, in fact, one of the convincing evidences to us that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God with powerful miracles, which he performed, and even his enemies had to acknowledge that he performed miracles, uh, healed lepers, uh, uh, healed the blind, uh, calmed the storm, walked on the water, and so forth. It, it's interesting that Muhammad claimed no miracles. Am I correct about that? Well, when you when you talk to Muslims and you ask them what did miracles did, what miracles did Muhammad do, they will tell you, you know, he was illiterate, he did not know how to write, and yet he came up with a Quran, which is from a literature point of view, it's very complex and very beautiful if you read it as a liter- Arabic literature. Uh, and they will ask you, how did he come up with the Quran if he didn't know how to write? And and many people don't really know how to answer this. Um, but I think the answer is very simple: how he came up with the Quran. Ever since he was a little kid, he worked with his uncle and his grandfather in, in merchandise and trading, and he went to Syria and Yemen twice a year. So for 40 years, start, until he started seeing visions, he basically went on maybe 70 uh, trips. So for 70 times, he went from Mecca to Syria. And what city is in the middle between Mecca and Syria is Jerusalem. And in that time, when Muhammad started uh, seeing vision, or before he started seeing vision, uh, Christianity and Judaism was very strong and very uh, apparent in Jerusalem. So I think, from my understanding and from my studies and from my research, he went to Jerusalem at least 70 times in his lifetime before starting seeing visions. And I think that's how he came up with the Quran. And that's, 
explains a lot of similarities between the Quran and the Bible. Okay, and, uh, that's interesting. I think that's an interesting speculation. Of course, I'm, I'm sure uh, some folks might not agree with that speculation, but it, it, it certainly seems like that'd be a reasonable thing to consider. Uh, of course, finally, in the end, Jesus died on the cross. We believe an atoning sacrificial death on the cross. Uh, how did Muhammad die? Um, Muhammad died from poisoning. Um, uh, I don't think they, there's an actual uh, res, uh, result to who killed him, but every Muslim believes that he was killed by poison. Somebody poisoned him. Okay, interesting. All right. Uh, let us grab... And something else, some, something else on this point. All Muslims believe that Jesus never died on the cross. They always believe that Jesus is the only prophet that never died ever, and he's going to come back one day and save everybody on earth. So, so they, don't believe, long, they don't believe he died on the cross, but they don't, in fact, they actually teach that he did not die at all. Yeah, but they believe he's the only human being that never, ever died. Uh, all the prophets died, even Muhammad himself died. But Jesus is the only prophet or the only person that never died and got to come to heaven. I'd and like to he's ask gonna him return about back. Elijah. And he's gonna, he's gonna, uh, yeah, he's gonna return to Earth, I believe. Yes, uh, he's, he's the one that's coming back to save everybody on Earth. Yes. Okay. All right. Now, uh, let's just skip our last break, Jake. We're going to run out of time here pretty fast. Uh, you wanted to talk to us just a little bit about the Muslim Brotherhood, and then we want to get to some questions that were sent in by email. Uh, tell us, tell us what we should be aware of concerning the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, I know a lot of people who are uh, members of the Muslim Brotherhood, and the Muslim Brotherhood organization they consider themselves as the biggest or the uh, most accurate. Uh, Muslim group ever, and they always tell you if you want to be a true Muslim, uh, you have to be a, a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. And it did start in 1928 in Egypt um, by a guy named Hassan al Banna, and he wrote a book. And his, in his book, he said that his ultimate goal and his ultimate dream is to establish an Islamic state. Um, and I'm pretty sure that sounds familiar now with all the ISIS uh, problems going on. So his ultimate goal is to start it or to establish the same thing that ISIS wanted to establish. But he said his way or his methods to start that, to establish an Islamic state, is through the way that people invented. So he said we can use democracy, we can use elections to get an office, and then we can cancel, and then we can cancel before us, so nobody can come after us. So, so that's the mentality the Muslim Brotherhood used. And we've seen that in so many countries. What happened in Tunisia, in Egypt, and in Yemen, and in all the countries that were ruled or had Muslim Brotherhood yet, they all came to office by supposedly fair election. And once they got so they start, so they practiced, all their they, they, they practiced deception in their in their promoting of their cause. Yeah, and when you talk to them when they're when they don't have power, they're very vulnerable. They're very kind and they're very humble. And they talk to you and they ask you to help them. But whenever they get in office, whenever they get in power. They completely destroy anybody against them. They completely destroy and kill their opposition. Okay, so we should be concerned uh, when we hear about the Muslim Brotherhood and and uh, the power that they uh, are able to acquire in vi different parts of the world. And I think we ought to be on guard about that in in, in political America as well. But uh, one one question that is always on my mind when. We, in, in our country, among those who we would identify as liberals in our country, there's a great tolerance for Islam and those who practice Islam. And, of course, we think that there's a strong prejudice against Christianity and those who practice Christianity. Could you speak to that? Why, In your mind, why is it that liberal elements of our culture are very tolerant toward Islam but not in regards to Christianity? Um, I think it has to do with, uh, people feeling guilty. Um, as I said, the Muslims or especially, or especially the Muslim Brotherhood, who's the most organized, the most political, um, um, members or group of Muslims, they always make, they always try to make you feel, uh, guilty and they always try to play the uh, victim role. They always try to be vulnerable and they always try to pretend to be very weak. So I think, uh, that appeals to a lot of people and people feel bad for them. Um, and that's why a lot of liberals, if you will, uh, you know, very tolerant and of them. But as you pointed out already, the Muslims are not, uh, they, they, they don't have equality for women. Uh, they are not, they are not 
Of course, we oppose homosexuality as a sin, but we are compassionate toward homosexuality, uh, to, toward those who practice homosexuality. We want we want them to come out from that. Uh, uh, we we want them to repent and and change their life. But Muslims will kill homosexuals rather than leading them to repent. So I, it's, it's just it's just curious to me that the liberal element of our culture wants to tolerate Islam. And oppose Christianity when, when in fact, I think if Islam gained power, uh, many of those with a liberal agenda would be the first on the hit list. Absolutely, and and that's that's the ultimate goal. Uh, they they try to make you feel um, guilty, and they always try to be very vulnerable until they get an office, until they have a powerful position, and then they will you will be the first person to go down. Okay. All right. We've got some questions from some listeners uh, tonight, Mike. I want to hit you with some of these. Kent in Georgia asks, what is the greatest defense of apologetic that the Bible is the exclusive, verbally inspired Word of God? So as you came to the Bible and, and began to investigate it, what was, it, what was the biggest uh, proof to you that it was not only the inspired Word of God, but it was the exclusive Word of God? You know, as a Muslim, or when I was a Muslim, um, I believe that Jesus never died on the cross, right? And whoever died on the cross was not Jesus. But then when I start reading the Bible, um, when when you read the, all the historical evidence back in the days, they will tell you that whoever died on the cross, whoever was crucified that day, was praying for those who were killing him, right? So as a Muslim, I was thinking, it was not Jesus who died on the cross, but whoever died on the cross was very passionate person, person who was praying for those who were killing him. And I started thinking to myself, I was like, would anybody ever pray for those who were killing him? It's a very challenging thing to do. And that's what, start, what made me start thinking, you know, whoever was on the cross was a very um, loving person. And then when I went to the Bible and, and I read Love Your Enemy, I really realized how God himself, uh, Jesus himself, uh, showed us an example on how to love our enemy by praying for those who were killing him. So you're so you're saying that the the most compelling proof to you about Jesus was his personal life, his sinless and perfect conduct of life, uh, even relative to his enemies. Absolutely, yes. Okay, good. Uh, uh, in contrast, when you look to the Quran, what? What about the Quran causes you to think that it's not inspired, it is not the Word of God? I mean, I look at the life uh, of Muhammad and how he lived his life. Did he live a godly life? Did he live a sinless life? Or did he live a sinful, uh, earthly life? And when you look at his, his life, you know, I don't think there's ever been a prophet that married 12 women just for pleasure, you know? So when you, when you look at his life and how he lived, uh, it's very obvious, very clear that he didn't really care about uh, his end. He didn't really care about how if he's going to go to heaven or hell. He just cared about to have a very powerful group of people during his lifetime that will help him to achieve all his earthly goals. And that's how I looked at it. Okay. Um, S Stephen in Georgia wrote some questions, and, and you may not be familiar with all the details in his questions, so I'll just ask you. Yeah, we, who spoke he is. Okay, so let me read this, and you comment quickly. Iranian Muslims are anticipating the soon return of the 12th Imam, Mahdi, and have publicly stated that he has visited and spoken with the Ayatollah. Where does that come from? Is he, is, is he the Antichrist? What are your thoughts on the timing of this event? Uh, I don't, I'm not really super familiar with uh, that group of Muslims. There's only kind of two sectors of Islam, Muslim, uh, Sunni, and Shia. And this question uh, caters more uh, towards Shia. And they believe, even when I was Sunni, even when I was Muslim, when I read what they believed in, they kind of believed in, like, very outrageous, crazy stuff. So I, I'm sorry I can't really not answer that question, but... The Shia just believe in really. Uh, are the are the Muslim are the, are the Muslims of today are they anticipating something imminent in in regards to world events? Uh, well, they uh, they believe that Jesus is coming back to save everybody, so that's the ultimate uh, event that they're waiting for. Uh, would they say that it's is going to happen soon, or do they do they try to make a prediction about timing? Um, there there's some uh, predictions in the Quran that tells you you know. The sun is going to come from the west, not from the east. And there's some stuff like that in the Quran that tells you when Jesus is coming back. But nothing is too concrete. Nothing is actually 
So they like, wouldn't they wouldn't actually, try to predict a day or a, a year or anything like that. No. Okay. Now, what about uh, what what about is there? He, Stephen also asked: Are uh, are Muslims of today having dreams about Jesus uh, acknowledging him as the Son of God? Do you know anything about that? Uh, I mean, maybe uh, maybe Muslims. Some Muslims are having dreams about Jesus because, as I said before, they believe that he is coming back to save everybody. So he. It's really ironic. They don't believe he's the Son of God. They don't believe he's the Messiah. They don't believe he died on the cross to save everybody. But they believe he's coming back. That, um, is, that does seem contradictory, doesn't it? To save um, everybody, exactly. Very quickly, the caller that called us a few moments ago uh, from Nashville said that the vast, 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 vast majority of Muslims are very peaceful people. Uh, what would your... I mean, obviously, you you even fear for your life in regards to the fact that you've left the religion of Islam. Uh, what would be your estimation? Is religion, I mean, we hear this all the time, Islam is a religion of peace. Is that your evaluation? Is that, would that be your conclusion? See, uh, the Bible is very clear and very, uh, very clear when it, when it says, love your enemy. And if somebody hits you in the right cheek, give him your left cheek. If somebody asks you to walk a mile with him, walk two miles with him. So the Bible is very, very clear on this issue. But on the other hand, in the Quran, as I said earlier, there is no one understanding, there is no one explanation of the Quran. So somebody can read it and take the verse to the extreme right, and it will be acceptable, and he, God will uh, judge him on understanding. And that's why Muslims nowadays, they cannot fully condemn ISIS as a terrorist, organization as a and as not muslims we cannot do this because as a muslim you can accept any uh any oh. understanding of the oh, so so they so can't the, one of the reasons i was asking this caller why why are the majority of so-called peaceful muslims silent in regards to condemning the the violent aspect of of the of the muslims and and you just answered that it's because a muslim is required to acknowledge that someone else can interpret the Quran differently than he does and still be right. Absolutely. Oh, and that's, that's why, uh, and that's why, you know, the biggest mosque or the big, the, the most, uh, the biggest Muslim preachers in Saudi Arabia, they don't really condemn ISIS as a terrorist organization. In Egypt, uh, there is a lot of, uh, preacher or uh, Muslim, uh, scholars who don't condemn ISIS as a uh, terrorist organization in Tunisia and all the Arabic countries in, in, in all the Arabic countries. It's really, you will never find a Muslim scholar or a Muslim imam or a Muslim preacher who says that ISIS are not Muslims and he will condemn them. Very uh, interesting. Because, I, that, that's a real insight to me there. I appreciate that insight for sure. Mike, we're out of time for the virtual Bible study tonight, but we sure do appreciate you being with us again. I was looking, I think it was about four and a half years ago we talked with you, uh, and you continue on your course of serving the Lord Jesus Christ, and we commend you for that. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for having me. Mike, a very good uh, discussion tonight and, and enlightening. Thank you for that, and thank you for our listeners joining in. Lots of comments in the chat room. Sorry that we couldn't cover those tonight. Just lots of uh, ground to cover in a short amount of time to do it, but a, a good discussion tonight. <laughs> Kyle, from your side of the board, uh, thanks for working to get those slides we, we, yeah, up Yeah, we had screen. Kyle working double duty over yeah, there. I think he was he was doing his best to, to follow along there with uh, get the slides up at the right time. Uh, it was Kyle, good. It's any comments? Study. Yeah, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, Dad, a good discussion, and we would welcome those who would disagree with us, and maybe even those who are practicing the Muslim faith to get in touch with us. We'd like to we'd like to have further discussion. We can talk more, sure, absolutely. Give Thanks, call, Mike. Give us a call eight seven seven three eight one four five six seven. Send us an email to questions at collegeu dot com. We'd love to hear from you, and we hope that you benefited from our study discussion of God's Word tonight. We hope you make plans to be back here this time next week for another edition of the Virtual Bible Study. In the meantime, we encourage you to put God first in your life, study His inspired Word, the Bible, and live by it every day. You'll never regret it. Thanks for listening to the Virtual Bible Study, brought to you by the College View Church of Christ. The College View Church of Christ meets at 1618 Hampshire Pike in Columbia, Tennessee. If you are in the Columbia, Tennessee area, we encourage you to worship with the College View Church of Christ on Sunday mornings at 930 and on Sunday evenings at 6 o'clock. The College View Church of Christ also welcomes you to attend their Wednesday night Bible studies at 7 o'clock. If you have any questions about something that was said on tonight's broadcast or would like more information about the College
College View Church of Christ, please call 931-381-4567. That number again, 931-381-4567. Or for more information on the internet, visit collegeview.com. Be sure to tune into the virtual Bible study this time next Thursday for another informative study of God's Word.